Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today for our last NSF NCAR Explorer Series of the year. Um, Ge geography Matters, meeting the challenges of climate resilience with geospatial technology with Dr. Olga Wilhelmi and Jennifer Bonert. I am Dr. Evie McCumber and I am an educator here at the U.S. National Science Foundation National Center for Atmospheric Research or NSF NCAR. NSF NCAR is a world leading organization that is dedicated to understanding earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I am really glad and honored that all of you are joining us today to learn more about how geographic information systems technology can support research in more than one area. For this event, you will be able to ask Jennifer, Jennifer and Olga questions following the lecture, and Aliyah will help moderate that so that we can ensure we hear from both our in-person and virtual audience. If you're in person, I know you will have questions, but please hold on to those until the end. That way the people online can hear you when we give you the microphone. I will wait for my music. Um, if you're joining us virtually, you can ask your questions using the Slido platform. If you're online, um, if you scroll down this webpage, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, and this applies to also all y'all in person, go ahead and click on the green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab. Jennifer and Olga also have a few poll questions for us. So for both our in-person and virtual audience, you can respond on Slido. For those in person, you can use your phone or laptop to navigate to slido.com and enter the code hashtag Explorer series and definitely be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts or word cloud question. What do you think of when you see the acronym GIS? Because we are going to get to that really soon. This event is being recorded and will be available on the NSF NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have NSF NCAR scientists, Dr. Olga Wilhelmi and Jennifer Bonert. Olga Wilhelmi is a research scientist in NSF NCAR's Research Applications Laboratory, where she's also the head of Geographic Information Science Program. She is a geographer with expertise in actionable and convergent research on human environmental interactions with the emphasis on societal risks, population vulnerability, and resilience to weather hazards and climate change. Her research focuses on extreme heat risks, risk perceptions and resilience, coastal vulnerability to hurricane storm surge, and use of GIS in analysis and communication of hazardous weather risks. Olga received a bachelor's in science in geography from Moscow State University and a PhD from the School of Natural Resource Sciences at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She has served in multiple national leadership roles, including serving on the American Meteorological Society's Board on Societal Impacts, she is a recipient of ESRI's Special Achievement in GIS Award, as well as the UCAR's Outstanding Accomplishment Awards for the Scientific Publication, Diversity, and Education and Outreach. She lives in Longwan, Colorado with her family. Jennifer Bonert is the Senior GIS Coordinator in the Research Applications Laboratory, where she serves as Technical Lead in the GIS program. In this role, she is responsible for coordinating GIS technical support services, overseeing geospatial data infrastructure and developing education and training programs across the institution and for external stakeholders and workshops. For the past 20 years, she has helped to shape new research initiatives at NSF NCAR by leading and participating in research on the development and implementation of new geospatial technologies and methods for the integration of multidimensional atmospheric data with traditional GIS data and analysis tools. Jennifer provides technical expertise in spatial analysis, multidisciplinary data integration, web-based applications, decision support tools, 3D modeling, and visualizations. She is a recipient of ESRI's Special Achievement Award in GIS, as well as the UCAR's Outstanding Accomplishment Awards for Diversity in 2017 and Education and Outreach in 2015. When not working with GIS, Jennifer enjoys spending time with her family and friends mountain biking and camping. Now, before I turn this over to Jennifer and Olga, let's check out your thoughts on our work cloud and Fletcher and Chris. 
may you please share a slide with us and see what y'all thought about what this GIS tell you. Let's see. Can we see it? Huh. I mean, I can see it. I think we have a, do we have answers so we can see them? Show results? Hey, oh, there's, uh, I panicked. I think it was the last event of the year and there was a panic. Okay, so I feel like we have good answers. Uh, Jennifer and Olga, what do we think about these answers? Yeah? Are you ready to talk to us more a little bit about what GIS is and what it's not? Cool, let's have them take it over. Let's do this. All right, well, thank you so much for this great introduction. And uh, just, we wanted to thank the organizers of this MCAR and SF MCAR Explorer Series for inviting us to talk about geography and climate and GIS. And uh, we're just so excited to see so many people here in the audience and um, everybody who is joining online. Um, so Jennifer and I are both geographers. We work in the GIS program in the Research Applications Lab. And uh, in all our work, we combine different expertise. We bring together expertise in science and geospatial technology. So we're not only able to help enable some of the interdisciplinary research that we will be talking about, but also um, advance geospatial technologies uh, through, through this collaboration. So at NSF NCAR, the scientists uh, study uh, Earth system. And not only the atmosphere, which is in the title of our organization, but its connections to the ocean, the land surface, uh, and even the sun. In better understanding these relationships, uh, and the NCAR scientists um, model, observe different uh, information about all system, use computing facilities. But through better understanding this relationship, um, the scientists develop predictive capabilities and applications. Uh, that are much needed for a range of stakeholders, uh, ranging from farmers and water resource uh, planners, uh, urban communities, um, and provide information that all of those different stakeholders uh, need for the future. So while uh, NSF MCAR as a whole uh, is studying the Earth system, doing fundamental and applied research in this area, uh, in the GIS program where Jennifer and I work, uh, we focus on the connection, focusing on the connecting some of the weather and climate model outputs to some major societal challenges, such as, for example, preparing for uh, extreme weather events or building climate resilience. And we're doing this work using geographic approach, theories, methods, some of the geospatial tools. So we're addressing a lot of the work that we will be talking about through a lens of geography. So in this presentation, we will walk through some of the examples from this work. We will talk about some of the work that we do on weather and climate extremes. Again, kind of bringing this geospatial geographic approach in the conversation about climate, climate change, and weather. Um, we'll talk about actionable climate information. And then we will take a little bit deeper dive into a couple of research examples. We will talk about our work on extreme heat. And also, we'll provide some examples about the work that we do um, regarding uh, storm surge and coastal flooding. And again, throughout all this presentation, we will be talking about the role of GIS as a visual language of geography. And um, so hopefully you will learn a little bit more about you know, the technology and the science that's behind it. So I think before we go next, we have another slide or question for you, and great job on participating in the first question. Okay, so the qu question was, have you ever used GIS? Excellent. 74% said yes. Yeah, and that's interesting. 26 said no. Well, if you've ever used Google Maps to navigate to a location, then you've used GIS. So GIS, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. And it's a technology that, in, that it connects data and maps. We could map a lot of different types of data from environmental data sets, population data, infrastructure, and yes, weather and climate. 
With GIS, it's not only for mapping data. We can also perform spatial analysis in order to take a look at relationships between objects and in order to visualize spatial patterns. We can use GIS for planning purposes in order to make informed decisions. And the work that we do in the GIS program, we take our data and we make it into information and then into knowledge so that our decision makers can make informed decisions based on the climate data that they receive. A lot of different organizations use GIS. Many different federal agencies use GIS, local and state agencies use GIS, as well as many different private organizations. So GIS is a software, it is a technology, but there's lots of different software out there. Here at NSF NCAR, we use a technology called Esri ArcGIS, but there's a lot of free GIS out there as well. So there's a lot of open source GIS applications you could use as well. Here's just an example of what the interface looks like for GIS. So in ArcGIS Pro, oopsie. Okay, I might need you to start it. In ArcGIS Pro, we have a lot of different layers on the left-hand side, and we can start turning on these layers. So we can turn on elevation and see how elevation uh, looks across the continental US. We could look at national land cover. And here we're looking at the different land cover classes are symbolized with a different color based on its category. We can look at population density by states. And here the areas in dark purple have higher population density. The power of GIS is it's not just a pretty map. There's information behind this. So we can click on Ohio and we can actually see the census information that resides behind that particular feature on the map. And I mentioned weather, so we can bring in NOAA's uh, radar. And I made this video back in um, the 1st of November. So back then there was a big storm system that was happening kind of right over Kentucky area. We can zoom in and take a look at that storm system and then we can overlay different layers such as transportation so we can see which roads may be affected by that particular st storm system. So GIS is a powerful tool for visualizing data, overlapping different data sets, um, but there's also a lot more that we can do with it that we'll be work talking about within this presentation. All right, well, thank you so much for this demo, Jen. And um, one thing that we wanted to um, share with you is that over the years, we've been working with other organizations, whether at the federal agencies and private sector, including ESRI, um, that uh, created the ArcGIS uh, tools that um, Jen just showed. Um, we worked with them on building connections between atmospheric data and geospatial tools. Because when we bring the climate data or weather data in these GIS tools, it opens up so many possibilities to start integrating this information with all kinds of other data that Jennifer just showed. So we can study impacts of extreme heat or better understand the relationships between uh, climate and uh, food, water, and energy security or look at the impacts of drought on the agriculture, uh, or for example, look at the transmission of uh, vector-borne diseases uh, as you know, they change with the change in climate. So there is a lot of different applications that now that we can study and explore. Also, as Jen mentioned, there is a lot of different organizations, local government agencies, nonprofit organizations that use GIS for operational uh, work, for decision-making, and by making our data available in a GIS format, um, we can also help them inform their decision as they start uh, looking into um, either urban planning or public, public health sectors and uh, plan for climate resilience and adaptation. So climate models come in a variety of spatial and temporal resolution. We're looking at a map here of a global climate model output and we're looking at August 2015 temperature. This is a model, the Community Earth System model, which was generated here at NSF NCAR for the sixth assessment report of the International um, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And this data is a roughly about 100 degree or 100 kilometer grid cell size. Working with data at 100 kilometers, we can look globally and see general spatial patterns of heat. We can see the cooler poles. Uh, we can see for the continental US, 
that uh, there seems to be a warming in the center of the US and perhaps cooler along the Rockies. However, if we want to start doing some analysis at more the US country level, it may be more appropriate to use a data set which is at a bit of a finer resolution. So here is a regional climate model and a Cordex, which is a 25 kilometer grid data set. And by working with a finer grid cell, we can now see more of the spatial variation of temperature across the US. We can start to really see how the Rocky Mountains have cooler temperatures and the Southwest in Arizona and Southern California have much warmer temperatures. But then some people want to do some analysis at even a finer scale, perhaps at the scale of Colorado. And with that, we might even still need data which is at a different scale. Here's an example of using a statistically downscaled climate data set at four kilometers for analysis at a Colorado scale. Working with this data, now we can really see some of that spatial variation. We can start seeing some of the hot spots of some of the urban areas, such as Grand Junction and Pueblo and Denver um, popping out. And we can see more of the, uh, how the topographic features really um, affect the temperature of cooling um, in the mountains. And some of our local partners do um, analysis at a city level, at a much finer resolution. This is the city of Denver. And if doing analysis at the city of Denver, you'd need data at more of a one kilometer grid cell. Here in the city of Denver, we can really start to see some of the urban heat island effects, which are caused by the impervious surface underneath. And we can also see some of the cooler um, areas on the fringes of, of Denver. So climate models come in different resolutions and the appropriate scale is important for your questions that you're asking. So now I'm going to show you an example of bringing in some of this data into GIS. So we're back in ArcGIS and we're going to bring in one of those regional climate models into the application. So here I just come in and I bring in a multi-dimensional multi data set. I'm bringing in T-mean, so that is um, mean temperature for the future for this regional climate model. When it comes in, it comes in symbolized in its own way. I don't really like that color scale, so I'm going to change this color scale to something different. So I come in and change it, so now I have a different type of palette. This is climate model, so it's temporal. This is daily data for from 2006 to, to, uh, to 2100. So that's a lot if I'm trying to animate over a daily scale. So I'm just going to do every 10 years. I'm going to change this. I'm going to aggregate to every 10 years. And I'm going to start an animation. So I can start looking at this data and seeing how temperature may change into the future based on a 10-year period. But we can do more than just visualize our data in GIS. We can start looking at some temporal profiles of this data in a time series. So here I'm going to go and I'm going to select a point in Denver in order to create a, a time series for this data. It comes in and it's daily, we can't see anything, so I'm gonna then change that. I'm gonna say I wanna see this every year so I can kind of better see how temperature may change in Denver in the future. So taking a look at this, our maps and our graph of our time series of our future projection of temperature, we can see that Denver is going, the temperature in Denver is going to be increasing over the next century. So in addition to looking at the average climate conditions, as uh, Jennifer just demonstrated, um, we can also be also concerned um, about climate extremes. And um, we're concerned about climate extremes because there is already scientific consensus that the human activities have caused approximately one degree Celsius of global warming um, compared to above the pre-industrial conditions. And even that kind of a maybe seemingly small change in the global temperature can significantly affect the intensity and frequency of extreme weather and climate events, including heat waves, cyclones, um, and fire weather. So let's just take a look at the past year. So this is the map from NOAA that shows the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters that took place just this past year in 2024 and we're not even done quite with the year yet. Um, but you could see that just in, in this past year, we had 24 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters that impacted very large areas in the United States. 
And some of those disasters happen simultaneously at the same time, and other ones were consecutive. For example, you may remember several hurricanes that have been affecting uh, coastal communities in the Gulf Coast and the United, in the Gulf Coast and Florida area. But in addition, there are tornado outbreaks, droughts, um, some of the severe weather events, and wildfires. The billion dollar disasters also have been on the rise in the United States. And if you look at this graph, so the uh, black line in the middle shows the average conditions, uh, the average number of the billion dollar weather and climate disasters. And if you can see this colored plot, colored lines, um, that most of these kind of really, you know, really extreme situations happened in just the last few years. And even the last year, even like this past year, 2024, um, it, not just exceeded uh, the average number of weather-related disasters. Um, the number of disasters was almost three times as, as large as the average number. So why are we also concerned about this? Because not only the disasters, some of these weather events are happening more frequently, um, but the risk of negative effects of those events is also increasing. And some of these events have significant impacts on human lives, livelihoods, on economy. And in our work, we look at the risk of weather and climate disasters, weather and climate events, um, by combining information about the hazard. And that could be individual events, it could be combined events or compound hazards. We also look at the exposure, what kind of people, assets, structures located in the hazard-prone areas. And also we look at the social vulnerability. And vulnerability generally is defined as the predisposition to be harmed. And vulnerability depends on a lot of different factors, but you know, some of the key ones are sensitivity to harm and the capacity to cope or adapt with some of those extreme and changing conditions. And so while a lot of NCAR scientists here are focusing on the hazard side of a risk and developing predictive capabilities so we can have, have early warning systems and better understanding how of those um, weather and climate hazards are changing, this changing climate, a lot of work that we do focusing on exposure vulnerability. And why this is important is because when we talk about climate resilience, Vulnerability can really determine how resilient communities are in the face of growing weather extremes and climate change. So resilience, <clears throat> resilience is defined by the uh, National Climate Resilience Framework, which just came out last year, is the ability to prepare for threats and hazards, adapt to changing conditions, withstand and quickly recover from these adverse conditions and disruptions. And so in GIS, we can bring together all these different diverse factors that may influence hazards, vulnerability, exposure, and visualize that information in a way that can inform resilience planning and hopefully risk reduction from those extreme events. And in this example, we're going to show just that. We have mapped here the number of days um, of heat warning in 2023 by county. Those areas in red show much, many more days um, that were under a heat warning than those areas in yellow. We also have brought in CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, where areas in blue show much greater social vulnerability. And as I had mentioned before, there's information behind these, uh, these colorful maps. So we can actually click on a county in New Mexico and see what the actual uh, social vulnerability index score was for that particular county. What we're going to do now is we're going to combine our social vulnerability with the number of heat warning days in order to create a composite index. This composite index um, is going to yep, do our number of days, our overall percent ranking of social vulnerability to create new data, to, to create new discovery. Here with our new index, we see those areas in purple have a much higher heat social vulnerability index. And this particular tool also generates a standard deviation um, map so that we can better understand those at risk. And the areas in deep purple are those at highest risk 
with, um, with a much larger standard deviation than average of the nation um, as a whole. And again, there's information behind all of these data sets. So that was a workflow of bringing data, combining data together and running a tool. I've diagrammed out that workflow here. Um, in that workflow, I used the number of heat warning days in 2023. But in this workflow, I've just changed it a bit and I've just done the number of days over 90 degrees. So these types of workflows where we can commute, compute from model data how many days have exceeded a certain temperature threshold, we can run it through some spatial statistics, um, and then we can combine it with other data sets to create this composite index. These types of workflows are, um, we're able to share these with communities who are also um, at risk from extreme weather events and extreme heat. And perhaps a community in Arizona, they may not, 90 degrees is probably not that hot for them. So they may want to change that threshold to 100. However, a community in Alaska may want to change that threshold to 85. So these types of spatial analysis and workflows can be shared with communities and help to increase the resilience of those communities to extreme weather events. And I think we have another Slido question before we <clears throat> progress. Okay, so which climate-related hazard is the most harmful to human life? There's definitely an interesting distribution of responses here because, of course, all of those hazards could be harmful to human life. But in the US, those who answered heat had the correct answer. So let's take a little bit closer look at the extreme heat risks and resilience. So extreme heat is one of the deadliest weather hazards in the US. In fact, it's a leading cause of weather-related human mortality in the United States. It's also major public health concerns because with changing climate, there is a growing evidence that the number of heat-related deaths may be increasing. CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, has statistics on the number of mortalities and morbidities associated with extreme heat. And you could see on this graph, on this pyramid, kind of showing the severity of impacts and also how it's proportionate to US population. So according to CDC, there is at least 700 people that die every year from extreme heat in the United States. And one thing that I should mention that heat-related deaths are largely underreported. So that number may actually be even higher than this statistics. We also see thousands of people being hospitalized or they visit emergency rooms for heat-related symptoms. And through our work, we also know that there are millions of people in the US that experience some form of heat stress that may be less severe than some of the impacts that require hospitalization. But nevertheless, people experience heat stress. And there's also growing consensus that those impacts will continue to increase unless there is equitable adaptation and mitigation that's being implemented. So for us, in order to reduce the risk of some of the larger, some of the more severe impacts of extreme heat, such as mortality and morbidity, we are trying to understand through our research what contributes to heat stress in the beginning and what kind of, what kind of symptoms people experience, why they experience, and how these impacts may be distributed geographically and sociodemographically. So again, there is a lot of research already has been done in this area, including the work that we've done here at NSF NCAR, but something that we know that extreme heat doesn't affect uh, all communities equally. And um, there is anybody, really anybody can be affected by extreme heat, but geographic location, economics, social and racial factors, and also presence of other hazards, whether it's other weather hazards or, for example, global pandemic that can also affect how people can cope with extreme heat. So all of those factors influence who is most at risk. And what we've seen in the, in the research that many of those impacts disproportionately affect black, indigenous, uh, people of color, communities, and also communities with low wealth. 
many of these communities live in neighborhoods that have been traditionally redlined. They also have less tree cover, uh, and therefore their temperature is higher than maybe surrounding neighborhoods. Many of those people also have less access to cooling, less access to medical care, and to resources that some of the local government may, may provide for people to cope with the impacts of extreme heat. And so for us to really better understand how this, how this kind of factors are distributed geographically and um, regionally, um, so we're looking at a lot of different questions um, on risk perceptions, risk responses across the United States. And here I have an example of the project that was funded by the National Science Foundation, and we've been working on this with our collaborators from um, several universities. And in this example, we are combining the national survey data with some of the geospatial and statistical tools to look at the responses, perceptions, and experiences to extreme heat across the United States. So here we're looking at the um, a uh, question that was asked about risk perception, and it's actually only just one dimension of risk perception, which is worry. And so we asked people, uh, how worried are they about the impacts of extreme heat on their health at home? Not outdoors, at home. And what you can see from these maps that you know been kind of aggregated on this common scale um, by the state, you could see that by, if you look at the total adult population, maybe um, the, uh, the numbers are not very high, but there's a higher numbers in the southern states, western states, and also some of the areas in the northeast. But what's also really interesting, if you start looking at the distribution of worry among black, Hispanic uh, communities, uh, Asian, um, Asian American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island, Islander, and other non-Hispanic uh, communities, then the worry about extreme heat um, is much higher. So what we also see that men and women also have different worry about extreme heat, so we can look at this issue by gender um, and by other factors. But compared to white non-Hispanic, we see really big disparities in this, in this particular aspect. And what we also know from our research that people who tend to worry more about extreme heat also are likely to experience negative health heat impacts. So the first survey that we conducted in 2020, uh, where we wanted to better understand <clears throat> these experiences, perceptions, responses, and that was a nationally representative survey of over 3,000 American adults, uh, we saw that over a quarter of the U.S. population, 28% of the Americans, responded that they had at least some heat-related health symptoms during the summer of 2020. 15% felt too hot in their homes, and 13% had rep reported through having reduced productivity. So it's not only the health issue, it also could be a really significant economic issue. Also, coping with extreme heat could be challenging. While you know, a lot of different places in the United States have air conditioning, which is kind of our main uh, source of adaptation to heat, uh, but people who have air conditioning, 20% of those said that they cannot cool their home effectively for a number of reasons. And one of the biggest reasons is the high cost of electricity. So especially in those households with high energy burden, when the big portion of their household income goes to running air conditioning, those communities could be really vulnerable to extreme heat effects. So now let's take a look at the summer of 2023. We might say, okay, it was pandemic year, there was a lot of things going on, so let's see how maybe those responses would be different during the non-pandemic year. So one interesting thing, we can see a reduction in the response about the reduced productivity, and that kind of makes sense because maybe less people work from home than you know, people had during the 2020. But summer of 2023 was really hot. It was one of the hottest summers on record. And what we see in our data, that we see significant increase in the heat-related impacts. Reporting heat symptoms, 34% of the population, and 18% reporting feeling too hot. We also see increase in worry. 18% reported moderately very or extremely worried. But it was also interesting that the coping capacity didn't change. So we still see exact same numbers we saw in 2020, people having 
trouble running their air conditioning and having really trouble paying their electrical bill. So some of this work uh, really is important uh, to capture so we can better understand how we prepare for future extreme heat events and how do we develop equitable policies that could reduce some of these impacts and increase the coping capacity. So to better understand those survey results, we decided to map um, the heat, excessive heat, across the US for both those years of 2020 and 2023. Olga had just mentioned that 2023 was a very hot summer. And if we just look at the area that was under a heat warning at any time during the summer of 2023, um, is quite expansive across the US compared to 2020. So here we're just looking at the geographic extent of heat um, for those two years. We can also do some analysis and take a look at the frequency, frequency of those events. These new maps that I showed are aggregated at the county level, and we're taking a look at 2020 and 2023. The areas in dark red, again, are showing day, multiple days of extreme or under um, a heat warning. In 2020, it mostly was in Arizona and Southern um, California, many days, almost perhaps a month throughout that summer was under a heat warning. And when we look at 2023, the heat, although it, the, ex, it, the geographic range has, it, has uh, increased, but the extreme heat and the frequency of that heat has moved towards Texas and um, Southeast um, US in Louisiana. So these are just some ways that we're able to map um, heat as well as the extent and the frequency of these excessive heat events. So we know that it's getting hotter, and we know that the US is getting hotter. One thing that we can now do is start looking at future heat. This is a map of heat index anomaly. So a heat index is a common heat indicator used by the National Weather Service. And an anomaly is just the change. So we're using a base year of 1986 through 2005. And then we're looking at the mid-century. So we're comparing uh, to see the change in, in uh, heat index. With this map across the US, we can see that there's going to be a, a great increase in heat over our mountain areas, as well as the center of the US. So it's interesting, again, to look at the geographic range of this changing heat. But if we wanted to do a little bit more of a local level analysis of this information, here we're taking a look at the Houston-Galveston area. These two graphs that came up are called um, calendar graphs. And the neat thing about them, the wedges are the months, and then the rings are the years. So the top graph is kind of present day. The inner ring is um, 1986 and the outer ring is 2005. And we're coloring this based on the number of days that experienced a heat warning. With this top graph, we can see in the Houston-Galveston area, for kind of, we call it the present day, um, we're seeing maybe four to nine heat um, warning days, mostly in June, or July, sorry. But then when we look at the future, the mid-century, we're able to see that these excessive heat is really increasing in seasonality. Now we're seeing excessive heat from May to September and in frequency. If we're looking at June, July, and August, some of these years are showing that there may be a heat warning almost every day of the month. Using GIS maps and graphs like this can really help communities to understand their risk and better prepare for, um, for, for the future. Yes, and that's exactly right. And you know, we've been looking at the data at the national scale, but also this type of analysis can be done at the local scale. Um, and that information uh, can be used in preparing heat action plans, heat preparedness and response plans at the local level. Um, so here we have a map that's showing the uh, relative risk of heat-related mortality um, among the population 65 and older in, in, in the Houston area. And uh, this type of information could be extremely valuable for the public health departments to make sure that they design appropriate interventions and public health interventions to um, protect the health of um, their citizens. Um, there is also, as we heard you know, from previous uh, slides, that you know, we, a lot of people are really struggling with cooling and, uh, well, and equitable access to cooling. 
And so a lot of, again, spatial geographic um, information can be used to identify where to put cooling centers, how to design some of the more equitable um, approaches to provide cooling to people who may not have be able to afford air conditioning. There's a lot of cities that are starting to implement heat mapping campaign, and I believe we have a few cities here in the front range who already have participated in the heat mapping campaign. And uh, here we have just an example from the Houston area. And just by looking at this map, you could see a really big difference, almost 20 degree difference in temperature between different parts of the town. And this type of information can also help to think about how to invest in green infrastructure, which areas might need more tree cover or parks uh, just to reduce that urban heat island effect. And finally, of course, communication about the heat impacts and heat threats, not only with the residents, but with medical professionals, first responders, and the policymakers is extremely important. And this type of coordinated effort is needed um, so the communities can start building resilience future towards the future heat. And some of this work is already starting to evolve in a much more coordinated uh, manner. And uh, NOAA has recently funded uh, centers of excellence. And one of them is Center for Heat Resilience Communities. And as the communities will be going through the process of participating in, in this uh, planning and uh, preparedness activities, the data, the geospatial tools, the GIS are going to be extremely central to this work. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears. So we covered a lot about heat. We're gonna switch gears and talk about the flooding. So I think flooding was very much in the news this year. There were a lot of big hurricanes. Um, a lot of communities were flooded, not only from storm surge, but also from inland flooding. But when we think about the hurricane storm surge flooding, we, there is a lot of communities along the US sea, eastern seaboard and in the Gulf of Mexico that um, are vulnerable to, to storm surge. A lot of people think that um, hurricane wind is the biggest impact, but actually more people die from storm surge than from hurricane wind. And again, understanding the exposure, understanding vulnerability, and thinking about how can we better prepare and respond and how we can communicate the risk of storm surge to the public, that's something that our research team has been working on for a number of years. And we extensively use GIS to address uh, those questions. So now we're back in GIS and we're gonna be looking at NOAA's data for storm surge based on the different hurricane categories. Um, we're gonna zoom in to South Carolina because it's a little bit easier to take a look at this data in this way. The areas in red are over nine feet of storm surge inundation. And we're just turning on the different storm surge categories so we can really see the difference um, in these different categories. Zooming in one more time to Charleston, we just have storm surge category five and the category one storm surge. And we can kind of do a swipe so we can kind of compare and see what the difference would be between these two storm surges. Another neat thing we can do with GIS is take a look at this in three dimensions. So here we brought in the storm surge category three and we're gonna zoom into Charleston again and take a look at it in 3D. We have our red areas are those again over nine feet of inundation. We've overlaid 3D buildings on top of our storm surge data. And now here we can start to interact with this. We can move around, we can zoom, we can pan, we can tilt our data so that we can better understand which areas may be affected by storm surge. Um, and this type of visualization and this type of data that's available to communities can really help them know more about what is at risk and how to better prepare. And in addition to using this information for preparedness and planning for some of the potential impacts, um, visualizations are also used to communicate the storm surge forecast. So visualizations in general play a very central but complex role in communicating weather and climate risks. And uh, the maps are very commonly used by emergency managers, local officials, the media to communicate and warn people about the approaching storms. 
So, but the way this information is being created and visualized can vary quite a bit. And so here we just have four examples of the same hurricane, but so many different ways we can convey this information. And there hasn't been really much uh, research until recently to look into how do people perceive this information? Does it help them make decisions? Does it help them to understand their risk? And in our program, the research that we've been doing, also funded by the National Science Foundation, is looking into what aspects of geovisualizations increase individuals' understanding of storm surge information and also the likelihood of taking protective actions. So there is a number of work that number of projects that we've conducted over the years, but one of the central part of this work is to work in communities <clears throat> affected by uh, hurricane storm surge and get a better uh, perspective of how people use this information, what experiences they had, and what information could be useful for them the next time they will you know, see an image of a storm surge forecast in the media or coming from official sources. So in hope that that information could be more helpful. So here we just have a couple of examples from the focus group research. Again, the combining geospatial work with the social science methods. Um, we talked about survey, now we're using more qualitative social science methods, focus groups. Um, where we are talking to people in New York City, in Savannah, Georgia, in communities that have been affected by hurricanes and experienced significant flooding. From these conversations, we can take information from what we hear and we can start developing those kind of different prototypes of visuals, whether you know, we're changing scale or we may change symbology, or we can start putting labels on a map that uh, represent recognizable places that communities or residents can better understand. Um, there is also, we can include some of the visuals such as kind of more realistic images to show what is a six foot flooding looks like versus nine foot of flooding can look like. Because especially for communities who have never experienced significant storms, they may not quite visualize what the impacts may be. And then again, we uh, test, you know, this type of information in the focus groups and we get a lot of really interesting input from people. Um, here's just a couple of quotes that we wanted to share today, but for example, when we showed this first map, um, the participants were saying that, you know, it wasn't terribly useful because they couldn't find their home, they couldn't find the roads. And that just highlights these importance of localization and personalization in communicating storm surge forecast, but not only storm surge, but other weather, weather risks as well. The same map, same forecast, but now we're changing symbology and we're adding those flooded houses, image of the flooded houses. And for this participant, many participants thought that was really helpful for them because not only they can better understand their risk, they can start thinking about what actions they need to take to, to protect their home, to protect their um, assets, or maybe to make a decision to evacuate. And Another interesting thing that we explored through this focus groups is the aspect of dimensionality. Yeah, so along with those 2D static maps that we created, we also created this 3D animation to show the participants at the focus group. Here we are looking at storm surge forecasts and we're integrating it with a realistic environment. This is a hypothetical area that's based on Tybee Island in Georgia. But looking at it in a couple different views, first the overview, and we're able to see storm surge coming in from the ocean as well as it's coming up from kind of that river that's coming inland, um, as well as a timing, there's a time clock on the bottom there you can see. But then we also are looking at it at a street level view to get a better idea of the movement of water over a realistic object such as cars and trees and houses. And these types, this type of animation is great for also educational purposes to show people what does a three foot, what does a six foot along with those static images of houses. And what we found through um, all of these different visuals and the investigating how this visualizations affect people's understanding of risk is that are showing information at multiple scales were very effective because maybe if you're showing information at the regional scale, it helps to understand the extent, regional extent of the flooding, maybe make decisions about 
you know, which direction do you need to drive to evacuate, which highways may be affected. But some of that local level maps, especially with recognizable features and the features that people can really relate to, kind of drove home some of the kind of a more, um, you know, information about taking protective actions and uh, making decisions about evacuation. So we learned a lot in this project and we wanted to communicate some of that information. So we developed a story map, which is looking at our best practices of developing these storm surge visualizations. A story map embeds text, images, maps, videos, all together into a digestible format to communicate. Storytelling is becoming increasingly popular in trying to communicate complex scientific information to a number of stakeholders and the general public. Using this story map technology is a great way to help communicate hazards, risks to communities. And that really kind of you know, concludes our presentation today, but we wanted to leave you with a few takeaways, a few takeaway messages. So we talked today about um, changing climate and how changing climate affects different climate extremes. And so many communities are facing increasing risks from weather-related hazards that are fueled by climate change. We also talked about the geographic approach, you know, how by combining different knowledges, different disciplines in spatial data, we can focus on a place and we can explore relationships between people, environment, culture, and all kinds of other factors that really help us understand who is vulnerable and why, how these risks are changing, and what would be the most effective resilient solutions that would be place-based and geographically relevant. We also talked about GIS, how GIS is a visual language of geography that allows us not only to map data, I know a lot of people think GIS is a mapping tool, but there is so much more we can do with analysis and visualization in science communication. And uh, there is a lot of efforts uh, that's going on in communities with climate resilience planning and many decision makers are using uh, this kind of tools in the data that um, different agencies and organizations like NSF NCAR provides. And so today we talked about examples of extreme heat and coastal flooding just for kind of illustrative, illustrative purposes. But a lot of work that we do spans a whole range of other weather disasters. We're working on drought impacts, looking at impacts of air pollution, on health, impacts of wildfire, winter storms, and also looking at the compound impacts of some of those uh, events as well. So of course, not you know all this work. Um, we have to acknowledge our funding funders. A lot of work is funded by National Science Foundation, by NASA, Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, of course we wouldn't be able to do this work without our collaborators from different universities um, that we've been uh, working together for a number of years now. And with that, I think we're going to stop and uh, take any questions. And uh, everybody. But we have, ooh, okay, we already have And if you'll in the wait, room. I'll bring a microphone oh, yeah, we'll to you mic. so that the folks <laughs> online can hear your question as well. To what extent do you get involved with providing risk mitigation strategies? Or is that left up to individual states, counties, communities? So maybe I, I can take this question. So much of the work uh, that we do involves part close partnership with the stakeholders. So for example, um, if we work with the health department in the city of Houston, so we work with them to not only identify the areas of risk, but we also organize, let's say, stakeholder meetings and workshops, and we bring together uh, different organizations that may be uh, responsible for uh, taking care of unhoused population or people who think about the green infrastructure or people who are concerned with utilities and energy. And so while we're not developing mitigation strategies ourselves, but we're working in partnership with the stakeholders and we're facil facilitating that dialogue. Any other questions in the room behind you, Aaliyah?
Um, I'm curious in the spatial analysis side, if you're working on or if you already have a metric for when mitigation is no longer possible and it moves to relocation or something more drastic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely that's definitely an option, and especially um, you know in some communities that may be affected by frequent flooding, um, you know they're faced with decision. You know what kind of mitigation efforts to design, and uh, you can do you can relocate, you can do nothing, or you could you know you know change the infrastructure in a way that could protect, provide some protection. And um, again, that's not something that you know we have explicitly advised community on how to do that, but by providing data and information um, in the way that's most useful for making those decisions. Um, so that's how we see our role. We're going to move to an online question. Um, so if you could bring up Slido. Um, going back on that uh, concept, what is the source of data on risk perceptions and is it available for cities or counties? Okay, so this is a great question. So the source of data for risk perception um, is the uh, nationally representative survey that we have conducted through in our projects with the funding from the National Science Foundation. And um, a couple of maps that I showed in my slides when I talked about different experiences and coping and capacity showed the geographic distribution of respondents from those surveys. Um, but our colleagues at Utah State University are working on spatial methods to um, statistically uh, to use the survey results in the census data to basically create, create this risk perception um, measures for most of the counties and municipalities in the U.S. And that's something we're actively working on. Questions in the room? Oh. Val and Simon, Oli is coming. I think she's going to get Simon first. Thanks. Um, what ways are you using AI in your work? And how do you see that evolving? It's disrupting much technology. It's advancing it. Um, how do you see it advancing GIS? Like, What's it going to be able to do? in 10 years, 20 years? Well, do you know what? And currently, we haven't jumped into the AI yet. But in the GIS world, they are starting to move in that direction. And there's something called GeoAI. Um, so I've only seen a demo on it, but it does seem pretty incredible where you ask a question such as, show me, um, show me how, like, and you could even just ask it, show me how many days Boulder County had a heat warning in 2020. And then that GeoAI would go back, it would find the data it needs, it would do the analysis it needs to do in order to end up with that result. So I do feel like GIS is moving into the AI world. Um, I feel like so many other places that are moving to AI, right? it does all the work for you. So a lot of people would say, well, I want to see what the data you're using. I want to see what the analysis you're doing. Um, but they are starting to move into that direction. And, um, and what I hope is that it will just make, in terms of the data, it will make data easier to find. It'll make data more accessible, um, is my hope in the future. But definitely GIS is moving in that direction. And maybe I can just add, you know, we've been discussing this uh, inclusion of AI into the GIS in the geospatial communities for a number of years now, because just as um, data become, became a service, analysis, analytical tools became a service, so now people are really thinking, you know, the answer should be a service as well. And uh, how can they just start asking questions and getting results? So, but I think there's a lot of potentials there, but... Uh, Personally, we haven't quite explored that yet. Hi, great talk, thank you. Um, so I understand in, um, I hear about in South Asia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, that um, a, main, a, a big 
source of problems is the, the, that the nighttime temperatures are not dropping enough for people to for their bodies to cool off to be able to cope with the daytime heat. And so there's sort of beginning to be migration northward, particularly of people with um, less money who can't afford AC or whatnot. And is that something that you have been able to measure? And what do you see? And does that seem like something that could you could imagine also like migration northward? I, th I think that's definitely a possibility. I don't think we quite know enough about the human system. I think, you know, we, we have, you know, there are a lot of uncertainty in the climate system and the earth system, but when it comes to humans and understanding humans, human decisions and human behavior, um, there's probably much higher uncertainty uh, to really understand what, you know, how people are going to respond, you know, to some of those really big extremes. Um, we are starting to work with India in particular to understand the impacts of extreme heat on health and not only extreme heat, but combined impact of extreme heat and air pollution to develop early warning systems, to understand the capacity of people to respond to those early warnings if information is available. And that's something we are hoping to explore both with the communities and the decision makers, because I think that some of those mass migrations, I think, it's definitely, I think, on a lot of people's minds, but, uh, you know, it's not something that, again, we have, you know, explored. What resources do you provide for the general public? Um, do you provide any resources for the general public for about climate change and the climate data that you're putting together? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. We, we do provide quite a few um, resources, and actually on our website there, you can go to our data and tools and you can see all of them. But uh, a couple that I'll talk about, one is our climate inspector. Um, and that's been out for quite a while, for maybe almost 20 years. Um, and that's a way that we are distributing climate information. We're using maps and graphs, it's interactive. You can go through time in order to better understand what is a changing climate, and a little bit more about the climate models as well. We also there have an extreme heat inspector, which is looking more at kind of urban areas and looking at date, like what Valerie had mentioned, the daytime and the nighttime heat, because that's really important in urban areas and for extreme heat. So we do have a few interactive tools um, on our website there. And of course, we are working very closely with the other NCAR scientists to help get their information out into a usable format, specifically for the GIS community to be able to start ingesting that data into um, geospatial tools. And maybe I can, if I can just add to that. So for any students in the audience or any um, instructors, professors, we also developed a number of tutorials um, that are available for, for public, for anybody who is interested in learning more about how to integrate weather and climate data into GIS. So all of those tutorials are also available um, on this website by going to Learn GIS. <laughs> um, we have a question online from Carl Drews. Um, he asked, how can the Oregon and Washington coast be under a heat warning in 2023? Is the heat warning generated by change in heat from normal temperatures or by temperatures and or humidity that the human, human physiology cannot stand? Okay, so I, 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 can, I can take this question. So there are different metrics that the National Weather Service uses to issue heat warnings. And in some states, so in in some states national Weather service uses heat index kind of like what what jennifer showed and the threshold for heat index is determined based on the local condition so for example in houston texas the heat warning is issued when the heat index reaches 113 mm -hmm. so very high 
So in, on the west coast of the United States, the National Weather Service forecast offices have been using a new index. It's called Experimental Heat Risk Index. And that particular index is not so much county-based, but it's very locally based, and it's based a lot more on the relationship between the heat and the human response. So that index has been developed in collaboration between National Weather Service and the Centers for Disease of Control and Prevention. And so the data in Oregon and Washington were most likely to use heat risk index to issue their heat warnings and advisories. And person. Okay, I'm going to go back to Slido, if you can, please. Uh, we have a question from Bernadette. She wants to know if GIS can be used in other planets besides Earth to generate maps. Well, we have never done that. <laughs> <laughs> But we've always wanted to work with our HAO department here at NSF NCAR, who works in the sun, and see if there's some type of collaboration we could have with them. You know, every single planet's got a bit of a different coordinate system, and GIS works on a coordinate system. So definitely, if you wanted to map another planet, such as Mars, you would just need to make sure you had that data and the coordinate system of Mars, um, and you definitely could potentially map map other planets, absolutely. Questions in the room? Okay. There's uh, a question in line from Mike. Uh, it went away. Uh, Mike wanted to know if he could, um, let me restart a question. Oh. I saw it disappear. It existed. <laughs> Uh, he wanted to know if there was like an archive of storm flooding that he could put in his address and get an answer at to what storm surge level would start to enter his home. Well, it's not something that we have provide, but provided, but we have uh, some of our scientists here at NSF NCAR that have developed a hurricane risk calculator. And I believe some of that work is specifically focusing on that very much localized um, information about flooding. And also private companies, um, First Street, mm -hmm. uh, there are some private companies that are starting to do that right now as well, providing that very localized yeah. risk, not only flooding, but other hazards, fires and other things. And, and if I'll just add to that, um, in GIS, I showed that data, and that data that I showed, the storm surge data for the different hurricane categories, that's a NOAA product. And what that is, that is the worst case scenario under the best storm um, conditions for each hurricane category. So in GIS, you could bring in that data, and then you could type in your address, and it would zoom to that particular point, so you could see what that particular data um, is saying for your home address. But again, we were talking about different scales, right? And that data may not necessarily be appropriate to be looking right at your house and exactly what, what type of um, storm surge. But at least you could get some idea of if you're talking about a nine-foot storm surge versus a less than three-foot storm surge. So there's lots of different options for that. And of course, it's also much harder in a forecast situation because storm surge mm. forecasts are inherently uncertain and that certainty increases closer and closer to landfall. But still, there's a lot of uncertainty about location and how much water is going to be. And so um, communicating that uncertainty, that's something that we found was um, quite challenging. And so, but that's, you know, a lot of research is going on in this area as well. I actually, you just made me have a question. Um, so I assumed that storm surge, when you were talking about one or three or six feet, was at the location um, being observed. But are you saying that the storm surge is um, the height above sea level and then that's applied to every place from sea level? Or is the storm surge nine feet at any point where it shows up on the map for that rate, for that level? That's a great question, um, because that's something we've discovered in our research. Um, so the National Weather Service, when they provide the storm surge forecast, they use information 
but it says above ground. And above ground is the, uh, the pavement at any particular location or vegetation. Um, however, many coastal residents that we've worked with, especially those coastal residents that live on Barry Islands, are used to thinking about the surge information using the mean sea level information. And so while the uncertain information exists in some of these visualizations, some people even are adding additional um, uncertainty to that. And so, and that's something that we've discovered was quite, you know, was quite prominent in terms of um, interpreting above ground. Like even if you say above ground, you know, people interpret it differently and where they were from and what kind of experience they've had with coastal flooding affected their interpretation of risk. Um, and, and now I think um, there's a lot more recognition of this. And so I think there's a lot of really great visuals that the National Hurricane Center produces to really pinpoint and say, this is your ground. I was curious if you all consider or look at uh, nature-based solutions, looking at um, what might be available out there to help adapt or mitigate some of these impacts from these climatic events. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, we, so we have in particular in the context of extreme heat, so not so much with the coastal, coastal flooding, um, although some of our partners also look at uh, nature-based solution related to restoring some of the marshland and sand dunes, you know, along along some of the um, coastal areas and barrier islands. In the context of extreme heat, we're looking at the nature-based solution, um, basically trying to reduce urban heat island effect and whether that's replacing um, some of the paved surfaces with vegetated surfaces, more tree cover, more parks, or um, thinking about um, uh, even green roofs and things like that. And so, so we've had, you know, we have a number of projects where we uh, um, using numerical models to understand if you, re if, for example, if you change percent cover of one surface with percent cover of another surface, what kind of impact is going to have on the surface temperature? So, yeah. I'm curious about the acceptability of your data. In other words, do you find yourself pushing the data at various agencies or are they clamoring for your data? You know, in other words, you know, is it is it something that um, um, everybody is seeking out? Maybe like insurance companies or government agencies? Or where, where, where do you get the most draw for your data? Yeah, um, so I'd say it probably depends, but in terms of our personal experiences, we do find that people want our data, right? They want to be informed with what is going on. And we work really closely with the GIS community. And with the GIS community, we're talking about people from all different disciplines, right? They're, they're geographers, they could be hydrologists, they could be ecologists, and they actually really need climate data. And what I showed there before, but a lot of times they need climate data at fine resolution scales. So a lot of what we do is we do work with these communities and we do um, find new ways to disseminate the information and make it understandable. You know, because the data is there. The data, if you know where to find it on a website, you can find the data, but not everybody can understand what that data means. So a large part of what we do is we try to make this data understandable so that you, you know, because there's a lot of acronyms, and like every, everybody has got acronyms, so does weather and climate. Um, so we really try to make that data as usable as possible. But I would think, and in my experience, people do want this information now, there is uncertainty in the information, yes. And that's why whenever we do develop tools, we try to um, present that uncertainty in a way that is understandable as well. So I think that that's important as well, is to not only give them data, but show them there is some uncertainty. There's some range, right? There's some range of possible futures um, so that people can understand um, you know, how to use that data appropriately. 
Any other questions in the room? Uh, there's all sorts of things in the media about uh, China and what may happen with relations there with tariffs, things with uh, Russia, with Syria and Ukraine and everything like that. On a scientific scale, does what happens at the, the, the political side of things uh, – Yes. Um, can you stay out of that arena and work with your colleagues? Because obviously, you know, big land masses in Russia and and China, and they've had their uh, climate issues and everything like that. It, it, is it steady eddy, or is there waves to the relationships? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, so so far, we haven't experienced any major impact on the science that we do. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we do, um, you know, we do some work internationally, but at least, you know, the work that we presented here is very much focused on the United States. Um, you know, we are partnering with people from all over the world. And uh, again, so far, we haven't seen that impact. But, you know, I think you have a valid point that, you know, maybe that could happen in the future. Um, but we really, we really think that the type of work that we do kind of rises above a lot of those political discussions because, you know, we are, we're focusing on issues of health, security, preparing for extreme weather events, and um, the communities, cities, municipalities, counties, states, they really need that information, they really need to start making, um, they need to plan, you know, to be more resilient, and so we really hope that this work is just going to kind of continue as it has been. If I understood your question correctly, I would say the beauty of GIS and the aerial mapping is that borders aren't really a thing. You can access this inter or information from satellites and other countries can't really do anything about that. And since it's a weather thing that I believe you're talking about, I think them accessing that information would not be a problem if I understood that correctly. So, so yeah, so I think there's open data. So I think, you know, if it's open data that are openly available, I think, yeah, so we, you know, we have access to this information. But if it's, you know, maybe data that's collected by another agency that has a certain data governance that doesn't, that prevents them from opening that data, then, yeah, there could be some restrictions. But you're absolutely right. You know, we rely on uh, global models, regional models, satellite observations. Um, and, um, you know, we typically work in the open data um, area more broadly here at NSF and CARB. Any questions? Yes. Has there been much collaboration with OpenStreetMaps or other disaster relief measures? And how would you go about that collaboration? Do you know what? We, ha we have not collaborated with OpenStreetMaps um, yet, but I have gone to a lot of conferences and I've heard them talking about the work that they do and the data that they collect, um, and it is really exciting. We definitely use OpenStreetMaps information and data <laughs> as our base maps, um, for sure. Um, but from what I understand um, in OpenStreetMaps, and especially for the hazards, you know, it really is more like participatory type of data collection. And so that really is just sending people out and collecting the data, and they have someone who is going to be, um, you know, checking the data accuracy kind of on their end. But I think it's a great, um, yeah, it's a great organization, and um, and I encourage anybody um, who has the capacity to to get involved with it. But I haven't yet. Yeah. So many great questions tonight. Yeah. If there are no more questions, I have a question, and it's my question to us now. Um, if there are any students who may be watching this um, live stream or in the room, and they want to work in GIS or do some of the work that you do, what advice do you have for them? So yeah, so 
there is a lot of GIS courses that you can take um, at colleges and universities. So you can definitely go and get um, a degree in GIS or a diploma in GIS. Um, but once you already have some of those skills, I would definitely encourage anybody just to get involved in your community. There's a lot of different, you know, organizations and groups that meet um, to kind of talk about GIS and collaborate. So I really do encourage, especially here living in Boulder, there's so much GIS along the Front Range. Even at these universities, there's always talks like this. So I definitely encourage any student just to get out there, you know, um, go to talks, get up and talk to the speaker of the talk afterwards, you know, just make your connections. I think networking is one of the um, best things you can do in order to, um, to really kind of advance your, your career in GIS, yeah. Any other pearls of wisdom, Olga? I would just say, you know, if you were a student who may be studying at meter, meter, in the Department of Meteorology or Atmospheric Science, um, you can connect with Geography Department and you're at university. And a lot of universities have amazing GIS librarians because a lot of college libraries now provide GIS uh, resources. Uh, the data, the services, the uh, tools, and um, again, you know, there's a lot of different connections that can be made either through other departments or through the library. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have some resources available that are specifically designed for students that may be interested in maybe learning a little bit about, you know, how to integrate weather, climate, GIS, and um, all of those resources are freely available. So definitely encourage you to uh, check them out. Okay, let's give them a, oh, you have a comment. Uh, wait, Aliyah, can you give the mic? <laughs> Please. I just wanted to do a quick plug for another GIS related uh, monthly meeting. It's uh, for usgif.org. It's uh, the Front Range Area Community. It's uh, intelligence part of GIS, but we get together once a month and you can find them through the website. So let's give our speakers a hand. Oh, wait, no, that, well, yeah, just kidding. I was so sorry. False alarm. Let's keep that hand back. I'm so sorry. Let's just put it in my pockets. I'll make another plug as well. I used to serve on the board of GIS Colorado, and they do quarterly meetings uh, throughout the year, and I think they're doing some more meetings as well. Uh, like, I don't know if it's on a monthly basis or not, but um, yeah, giscolorado.org okay. if you want to get involved with them. I'm now apprehensive. <laughs> okay, let's give them a hand now. <laughs> um, and thank you all for attending this lecture on geographic information systems as part of our Explorer series. We hope to see you all again next year for Explorer events. We have not finalized the schedule, but check our, our website so you can see what we're planning for next year. Um, if you're interested in some of our past events, um, definitely check out our website so you can watch past recordings. Uh, if you are 18 years or older, please take a moment to fill out our three to five minute anonymous uh, survey that will pop in at some point here uh, to help us better understand the impact of the program and how we can improve our next event. That survey will close on Monday. You can find the survey by scanning the QR code. I uh, was trying to stall. Uh, you can also ask a staff member if you would like to take the survey using one of our tablets. I really hope to see you all next time next year and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>